In April 1985, as part of a trial pursued by British Airways, many of the world's fastest aircraft reunited in one place to test out the aviation world's latest star, the BAC Concorde, a supersonic airliner that could maintain a supercruise up to Mach 2.04. Only a few months earlier, the Franco-British aircraft flew from London Heathrow to Sydney in a record time of 17 hours, 3 minutes, 45 seconds, including refueling stops. Famous aircraft from NATO allied countries like F-15 Eagles, F-16 Fighting Falcons, Grumman F-14 Tomcats, Dassault Mirages, and F-104 Starfighters were offered the once-in-a-lifetime chance to chase the Concorde. But despite their best efforts, time and time again, these guardians of the skies could simply not reach the Concorde. Only a fellow British Aircraft Corporation model would beat the others to the punch. A single BAC Lightning Interceptor, flown by pilot Mike Hale, managed to overtake Concorde on a stern conversion intercept. While the pilot described the Concorde as a very hot ship, he knew the aircraft he was piloting was nothing less than the fastest solely British fighter of all time. The Race for Supremacy When the Soviet Union dropped its first atomic bomb in August 1949, the West was stunned. Only a year later, the Korean War showed Russia's incredibly advanced technology in the form of the MiG-15 fighter. In Britain, there was now an urgent need for a new, fast, high-altitude interceptor jet that could intercept a Soviet assault and shoot down enemy aircraft before they could unleash a nuclear firestorm. As early as 1946, William Edward Willoughby Teddy Petter, the chief designer at English Electric, the designer of the famous Canberra bomber, had begun penciling ideas for that same concept. The following year, after the RAF issued an Air Ministry identification, Petter and English Electric were awarded a study contract for transonic research to delve into transonic flight, low supersonic speeds, and their handling. As the nation's first project of that sort, a transonic wind tunnel, the first of its kind outside the United States, was built to take on the evaluation process. In 1948, RAF Wing Commander R.P. Beaumont was sent to America to fly an early form North American F-86 Sabre. This aircraft was capable of flying at Mach 1, and Beaumont's experience with it opened a world of possibilities for British jet-powered warfare. Upon his return, Commander Beaumont met with English electric engineers to review his experiences and build the foundation of their new aircraft. By 1950, the contract agreement produced two prototypes and a static test airframe for the trials. However, during the development process, engineer Petter, increasingly frustrated with the management of the English Electric Company and the direction it was taking with military aircraft development, resigned from the company. Trials and Tribulations Despite his departure, the aircraft's development continued under his team's direction, and another engineer, Frederick Page, took his place. Under the sponsorship of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, a small-scale prototype of this model flew for the first time in December 1952 to mixed results. To fix the issues, the model was modified to a low-mounted tailplane. The new tests showed the modified prototype flying extremely well and validated the entire concept of Petter's design. The project continued to see significant changes, particularly in the wing and tail designs, eventually leading to the creation of the final prototype, the P-1B. The first true flight of this model, conducted by Beaumont on August 4, 1954, reached a top speed of Mach 0.85. On a follow-up flight a week later, the prototype hit speeds of Mach 0.98, even reaching past Mach 1.0 for a short time. On August 13, the P-1 officially broke the sound barrier and maintained level flight above Mach 1, becoming the first British-built aircraft to accomplish this feat. After much anticipation, a basic afterburning system was integrated into the design, and the aircraft reached Mach 1.5. However, the aircraft suffered from some stability issues at this speed, leading to a new prototype. In May 1956, the English Electric P-1B received the official name Lightning derived to reflect the aircraft's incredible supersonic capabilities. 
the English Electric Lightning reached Mach 2 for the first time during a test flight on November 25, 1958, piloted by Roland Beaumont, English Electric's chief test pilot. The pilot took the aircraft to an altitude of 36,000 feet to achieve this speed. This feat made the Lightning the first British-designed and built aircraft capable of attaining Mach 2 in level flight, a significant milestone in the history of British aviation. The model was ready. Into the skies. The Mach 2 capable Lightning Interceptor finally entered service with the Royal Air Force in 1960, entering frontline service with the 74th Squadron. That same year, English Electric merged with two other aircraft manufacturing companies, Vickers and Bristol, to form the British Aircraft Corporation. From then on, the Interceptor became widely known as the BAC Lightning. With its 1960 introduction, the Lightning became the second Western European-built combat aircraft with supersonic capability to enter service, just after the Swedish Schaub 35 Draken entered service four months earlier. Design-wise, production Lightning models had a clean and oblong-shaped fuselage covered in a silver finish with high-swept wings. The aircraft's cockpit was placed well forward and seated fairly high, offering great vision for the pilot from all angles. One of the Interceptor's most unique design features was the vertical, staggered configuration of its dual Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet engines within the fuselage. Operationally, the Lightning's powerful radar could scan the forward horizon above and below. With it, the pilot needed to do very little to take the aircraft within missile range of the target and fire effectively. This feature evolved Royal Air Force fighter aircraft from cannon-only platforms to fully integrated weapons delivery platforms from the Lightning to all current models. One of the most high-performance fighters of the Cold War, the Lightning Interceptor became the favorite aircraft of many of the pilots that flew it, garnering admirers all over the world, both in operational squadrons and flying at air shows all over Western Europe. The Good and the Bad The Lightning Interceptor was an impressive engineering feat for the British people. In addition to being the first British aircraft to reach Mach 2 speeds, and the first to have an integrated weapon system for automated missile delivery, the aircraft achieved many firsts. The Interceptor wasn't only the fastest British fighter of all time, but the last one to be fully developed by a British aviation company, the first to be designed with direct pilot input, and the first aircraft to reach supersonic flight without the use of an afterburner, as well as the first with the ability to supercruise. One of the pilot's favorite features of the aircraft was that it held the fastest rate of climb of any combat aircraft, according to aviation experts. The aircraft could famously go from its takeoff configuration to a practically vertical climb almost instantly. However, despite many wonders, the branch initially struggled to get over 20 flying hours out of each Lightning per month. A major hurdle for the aircraft was the fuel capacity. It could only be airborne for a short time before needing to land and refuel. While later versions of the aircraft attempted to rectify this with larger fuel and drop tanks, the issue was never completely solved. Additionally, because the Lightning wasn't equipped with many hardpoints, the armament options were limited. Despite its drawbacks, the Lightning's performance was far beyond what most contemporary aircraft could even come close to. Its potential was well based on its speed, power, and maneuverability, and it was not to be underestimated. Potential The English Electric Lightning was designed to serve a very specific role within the British Royal Air Force. More than a bomber, it was an interceptor. Born during the height of the Cold War, its primary purpose was to respond to potential threats from Soviet long-range bombers like Tupolev's Tu-22 Blinder, Tu-16 Badger, and Tu-95 Bear. The Lightning was all about speed and altitude. It had to intercept the enemy bombers before they could launch their deadly payloads there would be little time for dogfighting or tactical maneuvering. The Lightning was a pure interceptor, built for the single purpose of destroying incoming threats before they could reach their targets. A typical operational day for the Lightning would begin in a state of readiness. Pilots would be on high alert, prepared to scramble at a moment's notice. Should the alarm ring, the room would erupt into activity, and the pilots would dash to their planes, ready to take down the potential nuclear attack. 
Within one or two minutes of the alarm, the Lightning's powerful Rolls-Royce Avon engines would roar to life. The aircraft, now a flaming spear of British sovereignty, would be hurtling down the runway, its pilot bracing for the violent acceleration. The Lightning would quickly ascend into the high altitude, its twin engines in full afterburn, pushing the aircraft faster and higher. Upon reaching interception altitude, the Lightning's radar would lock onto the enemy aircraft. Its advanced fire streak or red top missiles were poised under the wings, ready to be unleashed. The pilot's breathing would be the only sound in the cockpit as he zeroed in on the target, his gloved finger resting lightly on the missile release button. However, the anticipated Soviet bomber assault never came. Although the Lightning went out on many sorties, it never had to fire a single shot. Its presence acted as a deterrent, contributing to the uneasy peace during the Cold War period. Outpaced. During the 1960s, the same decade the groundbreaking model entered service, as strategic awareness and the Cold War progressed, there was a rise in the development of alternative fighter designs developed by the Warsaw Pact and NATO members. The rise in these models only highlighted Lightning's shortcomings, like the range and firepower, which became increasingly apparent. One of the critical reasons for the Lightning's retirement was the emergence of more sophisticated long-range air-to-air missiles. These allowed enemy aircraft to launch attacks from distances beyond the Lightning's interception range. Simultaneously, airborne early warning and control systems became more prevalent, which reduced the need for high-speed point defense interceptors like the Lightning. The Lightning was eventually replaced by the Panavia Tornado F3, a variant of the Italian-engineered multi-role fighter. Some of this aircraft's advantages over the Lightning include a larger weapons load and more advanced avionics. This new model allowed for strike fighters' qualities with air-to-air -air capabilities, making them true multi-role performers compared to Lightning's one role. As such, the Lightnings were slowly phased out of service between 1974 and 1988. In those final years, the maintenance costs kept climbing to account for the number of flight hours the aging airframes had seen. The few remaining Lightnings in service were decommissioned in 1988. The final act for this groundbreaking interceptor was a series of air shows where formations of nine Lightnings flew to bid farewell to the model that changed British aircraft history forever. The final flight occurred in June 1988 as the Lightning flew to find its final resting place in a museum. With this, the career of the fastest British fighter jet to ever grace the skies ended. During its service, at least 12 operational frontline squadrons received the model. At the end of their production run, 337 examples, 277 fighters, and 52 trainers had been finished. While the model had an originally expected service life of only 10 years, the English Electric Lightning flew for almost three decades, a testament to the capabilities of this master of the Cold War skies. Thank you for watching the story of this legendary high-speed interceptor that redefined British air defense during the Cold War. Before you go, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this and all the Dark Documentaries channels for more historical insights and beyond.